One burning question for every National League team post All-Star break. This is part two. The American League episode was yesterday's, but this is part two. You got Arm Layden and I am Peter Apple. We got a lot of questions, Arm, whether that be trade deadline focused, whether that be specific player focused, and we're going to nail them here on the Just Baseball Show when it is all brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Remember, folks, use code Just Baseball when you download BetMGM, whether that be on iOS or Android. Why? A first bet offer up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if it loses. So you place a wager after using code Just Baseball. If it loses, you get it all the way back up to 1500 in bonus bets. If it wins, congratulations, you want to bet. I wish I could win more bets. That's awesome. But remember, gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. Must be 21 or older. Terms and conditions apply. Aram, we're back from the All-Star festivities. Yeah. I'm pretty tired. I know you are too. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's good to be. This is kind of, I know we did the the draft episode, but this is kind of my first episode back. I feel like on the just baseball show with this setup with our traditional setup. So uh, it's, it feels like I've been gone for way longer than I have. Uh, and I know you can relate to that when you went to Mexico. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about Mexico, but baseball in a moment, but no, it's just good to be back in the, in the normal setting here and everything. And, and it's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm a creature of habit. So from a recording standpoint, I love doing it how we normally do it, though it is great to do them in person when we can. That said, All-Star Week was an absolute blast, uh, and, and I'm already like looking forward to next year and, and thinking about all the things that we can do next year. But thank you to everyone who like hung out with us. I know you guys already said this, but I wanted to say it. Thank you to everyone who hung out with us, joined our draft stream, double the audience of last year. Like That's unreal. Could never have expected that, and uh, it was just so much fun just being able to cover it all week. Absolutely. And speaking of that, before we get into the Mexico part of what you wanted to talk about, I want to talk to everybody about our NL Central uh, Stadium Tour. And it's presented by us and Snapback Sports. So over All-Star Weekend, we did the eBay charity auction. A lot of people came through, supported, and it was unbelievable. And we have another opportunity. So all of us, Jack, Aram, myself, we are going to be attending five games in five days at each of the five NL Central ballparks, and we want all of you listening to come to the games with us. On July 29th, Atlanta Braves versus Milwaukee Brewers, so that'll be the first stop of our tour in Milwaukee. On the 30th, we're traveling up to St. Louis to watch the Rangers play the Cardinals. On the 31st of July, to Great American Ballpark to watch the Cubs take on the Cincinnati Reds. August 1st, Cardinals Cubs at Wrigley Field and we end the tour August 2nd Arizona Diamondbacks versus Pittsburgh Pirates at PNC the link to purchase tickets is in the episode description as well as in our link tree use code just baseball for five dollars off your purchase we'll be doing exclusive giveaways at each stop that you won't want to miss we'll all be at the games together We'll be probably enjoying a few adult beverages together. It's an awesome way to all just watch baseball together. Get your tickets now. You can find it in the episode description. A lot of time in the car, a lot of time at games, and a lot of time interacting with our incredible audience. We truly, truly hope if you are in any of those areas on that date, use code Just Baseball to get $5 off your tickets in our section. We're all going to be hanging out and watching baseball together. Please, please, please. It would mean the world to us to see all of you amazing people at the games with us. Yeah, just to build on that real quick, too. A couple things that are unique about the timing of the trip and the trip itself. I know I'm trying to get to all 30 baseball stadiums. I was doing that with my dad. I've mentioned that a couple of times in the show and I've been you know, embarking on it my, myself now without him and doing cool things like this to be able to check off stadiums or, or special events or doing it with friends. So this is another really cool way where I'm going to be able to check off two more and get to the point where I'll only have two left. So would love to be able to check off a couple more with our listeners. Also, it's going to overlap with the trade deadline and just the time leading up to it. So you know what we're going to be talking about at these ball games. Like we'll just be chopping it up, doing mock trades and stuff while we're watching the game and sipping on a beer. So excited about that. And as Peter mentioned, some really exciting giveaways, but also just a bunch of stuff that comes in with, with the purchase of the ticket uh, that comes from our partners that we're excited about as well. So it's different at each stop, but you'll see that when you go to 
buy those tickets. But one of my favorite things in the world is when we go to a game and we end up running into somebody that listens to the show or, you know, we may have crossed paths with in the past. And, you know, now we get to do this you know, more than ever. Uh, so I'm pumped about that. I'm really excited about everything except for the miles that we're going to drive. But that's what makes it like a fun challenge almost to do these five and five days. And uh, I think one it's going to be a lot of fun. One more quick thing, too. I love the National League East and the American League East. We love the West Divisions. But our National League and American League Central fans are some of our loudest, most loyal, awesome listeners that we have. So for all those Brewers fans DMing me that I'm on your side and Jack is on the other side, I better see you at the game. The Cardinals fans, the Reds fans, the Cubs fans, Pittsburgh Pirates fans, we need is, you guys at these games. Is Jack ditch, is, is Jack skipping Milwaukee? I know he can't go to all of them because he obviously has that play-by-play -play thing he has to do or whatever. Yeah, you know, but, he's um, AAA broadcaster for the Pirates, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's not a big deal. Not a big uh, deal. He should be able to go to Milwaukee instead and just say, just play the game on. He, you know, Howard Kelman can take it over. I hope, because he's going to be at one of the games, I hope it's Milwaukee because I want I him hope, to stand in front of those Brewers fans and answer questions. I, I I also hope he doesn't, though, because then we can just run with the narrative that he's That's scared true. of Milwaukee. That he's just, afraid just, of Milwaukee. I yes, like that. Yes. Either way works. He's either going to yeah. get bombarded in Milwaukee or he's going to miss it. We could call him a fraud. So yes. it's a lose-lose situation for Jack Bullard, which is both of our favorite things. Yeah, which is a win-win for me and you, <laughs> and it's beautiful. So before we move on to one burning question for every National League team post All-Star break, let's go back to what you were talking about originally. Robinson Cano is doing things in Mexico, isn't he? Yeah, I, I had no idea. I always check in from time to time because these Mexican League rosters are so funny to like, you're like, oh my gosh, I thought that guy was out of baseball for years. Oh, wow. This guy's still going. Um I never see a stat line as absurd as what I saw from Robinson Cano in the 68 Mexican league games. He's playing the ball flies out there. We know that when they play that game out there every year, the over under is like 30 runs yeah. on bed MGM. That said, I don't care if he's playing in, in Williamsport. Like this is an insane slash line from a 41 year old here Four in 68 games, 446, 490, 674 with 14 home runs, 37 extra base hits, and 68 driven in. I, I mean, again, I know this league is not that good and it's very home run driven, but that is insane. Yes, like, still. This guy's almost hitting 500 in a professional baseball league at 41 years old. That swing was always going to play, man. And he made a slight adjustment. Like he's starting pretty much exactly where he needs to be instead of having that big load and the big rhythmic thing. And it's working. And he he's a monster. I wonder if someone gives him a shot one more time. Like he, he couldn't possibly be any better right now. So you you think he made a swing adjustment post 40? Yes. That's incredible. He's starting all the way back on his back leg and not doing, you know, the barrel tip rhythmic load that was so buttery. But like, as you're older, that's so much harder to repeat in time. Now he's just starting stacked on his back, back leg and goes and it works. But I don't know if they test for PEDs out there. It would be hilarious if he just was like back on that allegedly and just hitting bombs in, in Mexico at 40, 41, just, just for the vibes. So for everybody listening, when we do our trade deadline preview episodes closer to the actual trade deadline, we're going to put Robinson Cano on a list of like possible acquisitions at the deadline for the bit. And so everybody listening to this one now knows. So for anybody who hasn't listened to this one and just starts to hear Robinson Cano potentially getting signed or something at the deadline, just know it's a bit. Yes. Oh, but at the same time, bits. like maybe at the same speaking time, maybe. I legit, I, I mean, he's better than some players, I think. In <laughs> Speaking of bits, last thing, I just got a notification on Twitter, X, whatever. I got quote tweeted that Robinson Cano, you know, tweet that I put out, that the username is Cal Quantro number one fan. So that's weird. That's my burner. Yes. And it, it says, is he being blackballed by the league? Question mark. Because of the leak he's lighting up. I don't need to explain anymore, but that is a very funny quote tweet in reaction to that stat line in Mexico. Uh, but we can go into burning questions now. One burning question for every National League team. We are going to start in the National League East. We're going to go team by team. I have a question. Arm has a question. Um, Jack and I were just kind of going back and forth. I'll start with the Phillies. You can start with the Braves and we'll just alternate. Okay. Um, so for the Phillies, my burning question is, is this the year they add the big time center fielder at the deadline? Because I think when you look at the Phillies, I'm not, my question is, isn't, are they going to be aggressive? 
Like my my question is, is that aggressiveness going to be slated in the center field position? Because you look at the Phillies, could they use another bullpen arm? Sure. Even though Matt Strom, Jeff Hoffman, Orion Kirkring, Jose Alvarado create an incredible back four in that bullpen, but you can never have too many bullpen arms. Of course. Do I think they're going to go and get a big time starter? I don't think they need one. Could they get a, you know, guy to just fill innings, kind of a similar deal to Michael Lorenzen? Sure. That's not what I'm worried about here. If they were going to make the big move, they'd be calling up the Chicago Cubs and saying, what is it going to take for Bellinger? They'll be calling up the Chicago White Sox and saying, what is it going to take for Luis Robert? Or something I have floated for, I think, three years. And it's at this point, it's never going to happen. But I'm still hanging on hope that they call the Los Angeles Angels and ask for Mike Trout. Now, I don't even know if Mike Trout is going to be healthy enough to play for the rest of the year. But I still am curious. Is this the off or is this the trade deadline where they finally add that big piece? Because that just seems like the piece that they've been slightly missing. Roas is a great defender, but at the end of the day, if you could get a Luis Robert or a Cody Bellinger or a Mike Trout, I mean, this team is dangerous already. Imagine that. No, I I was pretty much on the same wavelength there. And and it's interesting because I think that's going to kind of be the theme of, of the burning questions is, you know, the teams that might need to add or, or might just have one spot offensively where they need to add. Do they do it in a year where the offensive trade market projects to be pretty light? Like there's yeah. just not a lot of good players out there. So you either got to pay a pretty penny for a Luis Robert or try to convince a, a Cubs team to to sell. Like you mentioned with, with Cody Bellinger, like that's exactly what I pretty much had here with the Phillies was they're also the best team in baseball right now too. Oh, yeah. Does Dombrowski even need to Dombrowski yeah. was what I had because it's like, Yes, they, they could go make a move here or there, uh, but this is the best team in baseball right now. Every team, most of them look so flawed. They seem like the one that, yes, of course, you can look at center field and say that's a very obvious place to upgrade. And earlier, I'm like, go ahead, do it. But now when you look at the trade market, it's like, where where can they go do that without absolutely depleting the farm to a ridiculous degree when you know they're already, I think, as good as anybody? I, I'm curious. I, it might just be another one of those where it's, a little bit cautious they just go reliever and feel really good about their ball club and and just prioritize the defense out there but i i'm curious for you like do you even think they need to add anything substantial of course center field could be a lot better but every team has some sort of gap 100 percent. like not every team is perfect like there that seems to be the whole and at the same time do the phillies want to leverage the farm to go get luis robert do they want to trade big time prospects to go get cody bellinger I mean, Mike Trout, I guess, would be different, but w- w- there's no guarantee that he's healthy. And I think another element of the Phillies that isn't really talked about, I don't think this element is really talked about at all with most baseball teams, is the bond that this team has. Mm-hmm. Every All-Star was hanging on to watch Alec Bohm in the Home Run Derby, and you could tell that they were motivated. Like, this team has a special bond here. So Dombrowski, regardless of just looking at the F War or the WRC+, Plus, like, does this guy fit – in our dugout. I think that's a huge element. Huge. So like Luis Robert is really good. Would he fit in with the Phillies? Mike Trout is really good. Would he fit in with the Phillies? There's an element there. Of course, he's from Philly. So I would assume so. But Cody Bellinger, would he fit? Like would any of these guys fit what the Phillies currently have? Because you could say, yes, they'd be more talented. But will the locker room be the same? I don't know. Yeah. So I think that's what Dombrowski is dealing with as well. It's not just oh yeah, this guy is more talented than Rojas, but does he fit with us? And and I love that point because if there's any GM that prioritizes that as much as anybody, it's it's Dave and Dabrowski. That's who, why he's so it, good. It, exactly. You know, most of them try to, I was thinking about Moneyball and Billy Bean and how he like pretty much wanted to have no relationship with the players because you're trading them. And I get that. Like I, I would probably lean, I would struggle. I'd end up being friends with the players because I'd want to learn and, <laughs> and pick their brain. But I would want to try to be that way because it's really hard to just say bye see ya just sent you out for an 18 year old like it's way harder when you get to know these guys I know former players have talked about it they've never really been closer with any GM than Dave Dombrowski Jeff Conine still texts back and forth with him on occasion I I know several times a year Um, and that just shows you I think the kind of guy Dombrowski is and and the kind of feel he has so yeah I, I think that's the biggest question and unless it's perfect I don't think they risk anything I 100% agree and for the Braves you want to go first? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Braves are a really interesting one. And I really just left it at this kind of piggybacking on the, the same point here. How can they improve the offense this season? It is a light offensive trade market. 
their farm is relatively thin. And I think that's generous, but you know, they're always going to have pieces. They're always going to bring up pieces, but do you want to trade your, your two pieces that you really have in the farm? Yes. They have some arms that they could go move and, and that could make sense, but you know that they like just having those, you know, those arms in the stable and just a bunch of them have been hurt this year anyway. So like, I look at this team, of course, their playoff team, Acuna is out. He's going to be back next year. You hope he's, he's good to go, but I just struggle to figure out how they could really improve this offense other than it just improving from within. Yeah, we haven't talked about these questions beforehand, but unfortunately, for, I guess for our audience, I'm on the exact same wavelength. Yeah. And my question is, are the Braves going to be really aggressive? And I put really in all caps because you know the Braves, they're going to be making some moves, even when they had a great team adding Jock Peterson and Jorge Soler and Eddie Rosario. It's funny, they already picked up Eddie Rosario. Like, is it a trade deadline like that where you're just filling in the gaps? Or... Is Alex Anthopoulos calling up Ross Atkins and saying, we want to make a big deal for Bo Bichette and Kevin Gosman? Because you can make the argument that those are the two holes. Now, Orlando Arcia is a great defender, but I think at this point we have enough data to realize that he's not the hitter that he was in that first half where he made that all-star game. Right? We have much more data on him being a far below average offensive piece, but are the Braves okay with just running with that? Because the Braves are still a really good team with Orlando Arcia at short. But do they want to take down the Phillies even in the regular season? Adding Bichette, adding Gosman. And then there's no guarantee that Bichette just completely turns it around and is back to his normal self. And Kevin Gosman's numbers on the road are amazing and numbers at home. So maybe he's a target that they could go get, but that's going to take a lot of prospect capital. So that's my burning question with the Braves is, is it normal aggression or is it really aggressive? And then what would what would really aggressive even look like? And that that's my problem. I feel like they're a tweener here because yeah. w- w- like, again, it's, it's, it's a seller's market from a position player standpoint. They're pitching great. Like you don't have to worry too much about that. Of course, adding a Gosman, you take that opportunity to do it. But the reason but to me, just I to look at the outfield, interrupt you, just to quickly interrupt you on the pitching part, a lot of old, a lot of old guys in that rotation, yeah. like sale and Morton. That's a lot of age. Reynaldo Lopez first season as a starter. I feel like they have to add a pitcher, even though you look at the numbers so far and they're as good as anybody in baseball. Yeah. Yeah. And and you'd have a lot of, you know, a lot of trust building into Spencer Schwellenbach continuing to get better and, and be a guy, but yeah, I agree. Like you, you're, you're leaning on, on, on a lot of vets here and, and Chris sale, you hope can continues to hold up down the stretch and in the postseason. That's why I look at this team. And I'm like, it's good. They can make the playoffs, but is this a year where you just give it a shot with who you've got? Of course, make some small deals, you know, to, to try to reinforce things. You can go get an outfielder in a corner. Like they always do. Like you mentioned, go get a reliever. Maybe you, you make your big quote unquote splash for an Eric Fetty or something. Yeah. But I, I just don't know if it makes sense to, to push the chips forward this year because this is just a team that without Acuna, I know they won the world series without him, but still without Acuna, Michael Harris is dealing with a hamstring issue. Um, th- a lot of guys just are not performing to the degree that we are used to Olsen Riley still fine this year, but down years offensively for them. I mean, Jared Kelnick has been, been great for them, but like, I don't think it was part of the plan to be have him running out in center field every single day. Like it, things are not going according to plan. Sean Murphy's been you know really struggling. I, I think they were hoping that Rosario could be a bit better. Duvall has is, is really looked like age is starting to catch up with him. So I feel like you just hope that these guys can play better and you move forward and you make a couple complimentary pieces, you know, and add a couple complimentary pieces. But I think when you look at the farm system and you look at, you know, still how far they are off, like you can't fix this unless the guys that are underperforming start performing better. So I I'm really fascinated to see how they go about this uh, because at the same time, this is still a really good team. That's always a world series contender. And maybe Anthopolis just doesn't know any other way. I think I agree with you. Let's move on to the New York Mets. And for me, at least my burning question is staying on the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. And are they buyers or sellers? It's like a simple question for me, but that's the most burning question I have for the New York Mets moving forward. And I look at a rotation, Quintana, Severino, David Peterson, (laughs) potentially Tyler McGill. Like we just keep going through these arms and it's like, do we like them? Is this the rotation that we look at the Mets and say, yes, they're hitting well right now. The bullpen has been good in spurts. Like there's a couple arms that are good there. But can we look at this Mets rotation and say, yeah, we're going to buy here because if we buy, we're going to need a lot of arms here. 
But then on the flip side, if they want to sell, I think they might get a prospect for Quintana. They're definitely going to get a decent package for Severino. They can trade off from this rotation, bring up some guys. And then this is the bridge year that Steve Cohen talked to us about. So that's, for me, it's very simple. I don't know, and I don't even know if Dave Stearns in that front office knows truly if they're buyers or sellers. So this next three-week period, I think, is incredibly impactful for the Mets. I, I think you, – I'm glad you mentioned the bridge year because that's what I had. It said, if it's not a bridge year, what is it? Because yeah. I think they can't sell at this point. I, I, this is the beauty of having a – unless they hit a wall, of course, in the next three yes. weeks, like you mentioned. If, if, they, if they absolutely suck, yeah, then, of course, they can do it. But this is the beauty of having an owner who's legitimately a fan. And yeah. Steve Cohen, like, he's not – there's no way. They might stand pat, but I feel yeah. like if they continue this – if you're, they're in the playoff spot right now, they're game up. And I, I agree with you on the rotation, but you could also look at it if you're Stearns or, or you know, anybody in the front office and say, well, Christian Scott's back up. We were managing yep. his, his innings so that he can be available the rest of the year. I, I, I know that it's a rookie. You don't want to count on him too much, but – Compared to some of the names that we're mentioning, like Christian Scott's going to be good, and he's a solid option for them, even if he's a high threes, low fours guy. Yeah, if there well, was a if there was a thirty year old pitcher with Christian Scott's exact repertoire and talent, he'd be a big trade piece. Yes, yes. yes. So you you feel great about him, and 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 just having him back in the rotation. Kodai Sanga looks really good. I hope he can stay healthy, but he's thrown three rehab outings so far. One in high A, where the poor hitters in Hudson Valley just got pieced. Yeah. Pieced 32, uh, 35 pitches in two and two thirds. And they were perfect with no runs, no hits, no walks, six Ks. Just and dominating. then more, more important, yeah, insane. Average 96 and a half. And then in AAA, back to back outings where he was really solid, only allowed one earned run in about seven and a third innings. And last time out was scaled up to 67 pitches, held 95 mm-hmm. miles an hour. So you look at that and you say, okay, you're going to get Sanga back in the rotation. You get Scott back in the rotation. I'm with you. Like, I'm, I don't know what Quintana looks like or anything like that, but Manaya, the way he's throwing, Severino, yeah. Sanga, Christian Scott, I, that's enough to give it the old college try. And I think that's underselling it considering that they're one game up. So if it's not a bridge year, I guess they're they're just rolling forward. They can't deplete the farm though, right? Like they can't no. buy. Yeah, it doesn't make right. sense either. Well, they can't buy heavy. heavy I think they can exactly. buy small. And that's yes. on me for, you know, not putting Sean Manaya in that conversation when I'm talking about potential Mets pitchers that could be on the block or potentially just a part of their rotation. manaya has been great. And Fink came on, Ryan Finkelstein, managing editor of Just Baseball and the host of Locked on Mets. Just illustrating how good Quintana and Manaya have been when Francisco Alvarez is behind the plate. So if they're giving you five innings, one run, like they have been when Francisco Alvarez is healthy and right, which he is, these are good options. Especially, like, what I think they could do, maybe if they don't even touch the rotation, they know they're getting Senga back. They know that Christian Scott is here, that they manage his innings, and he's going to pitch for the rest of the year. And then you have Severino, Quintana, Manaya, Peterson, that's your six. Get two or three bullpen arms. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be crazy bullpen arms. They're not going to cost a ton, but that qual- qualifies as buying small. Then you're protecting the later innings when you get five innings, one run, or potentially six innings, two or three runs that you can hold on to the game because the offense is real. The problem with the Mets' offense is it's just so hit or miss sometimes. Yeah. But when it's on, we see the potential. We see an easy playoff lineup when they're right. Yeah. And if they can be right, for the next 60 to 70 games, this is a playoff team. And then anything can happen. 100%. And then I think just the one player I would want to circle in this lineup is like just a, a question for the rest of the way is Jeff McNeil. Because, yeah. you know, Jose Iglesias ain't hitting 380. And I don't know. I have more Actually, confidence at this in him. point, like maybe. <laughs> I have more confidence in him dropping another number one hit than hitting 380 the rest of the way. But um, he might do both. He, he might do both. He might, he might be the year of Jose Iglesias. <laughs> Which is kind of electric, I, and, and he is he is great for the vibes. Yes, but, yes. you know, you figure Pete Alonso is going to pick it up, but I'm looking at McNeil. Like that's got to be the guy that that pick, holds up his end of the bargain and, and helps this team kind of kind of keep rolling. But I hope they stand pat, cautiously add because I mean they've been outperforming. I think everything that anybody would have thought. The floor is yours for the Miami Marlins. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I think it's an obvious one, and it's just how does Peter Bendix do in his first deadline because. Mm. This is our first chance to really see him cook. 
you know, see him go about his business. He, he, he took over the team with not a lot of time coming into the season. Didn't want to shake too much up because they quote unquote made the playoffs. Uh, you know, they, they, I guess they really did. I can't say quote unquote, but like they got, they got they there did, and they, they got, got absolutely else. pillaged. And then, <laughs> yeah, now they, they weren't able to pick Braden Montgomery. So that worked out really well. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I feel like he's been waiting and it's been an assessment period. And other than capitalizing on the Louis, Luis Arias deal, which now looks like it was a good thing that they did it then. Cause he has really hit a wall. Uh, he, he hasn't wanted to do anything too crazy. He's going to, he's going to really, you know, cut loose here and the deadline. And I want to see what that looks like. It sounds like, you know, you're going to see jazz Chisholm go, but you know, that Tanner Scott's going to go and the market for him, even though he's a rental is going to be pretty substantial. Uh, I, I think they could trade a couple other pieces several other relievers that a lot of people have interest in a lot of teams have interest in so they have some pieces that they can move i'm really fascinated to see one how bendix goes about it are they acquiring 18 year olds and 19 year olds uh or are they trying to get guys closer to the big leagues like we saw with the arias deal for the most part two of the three pieces because i think that'll be a little bit of a clue into what is next what their timeline may look like but i'm most interested in just seeing what kind of players they target how he goes about it and you know, I, I just want to see what Bendix fully unleashed looks like. And this will be kind of our first taste of that. My burning question is kind of building off yours. Will Peter Bendix and the Marlins be able to get enough value for the players that they want to trade out? Because I think, you know, it's one thing, for example, Ross Atkins in Toronto. Will he get enough to actually want to trade Bo Bichette? Will he get enough to actually want to trade Kevin Gosman? And I think that's something that a lot of people don't like think about that yes he wants to trade these guys but if he gets terrible offers and the market doesn't value them like he thinks why would he trade them right so what does the market think of jazz chisholm right the marlins are showing their hand with him playing him at second base you even tweeted it out that the middle infield market is really you know thin at the deadline but do teams actually believe that jazz chisholm is a second baseman tanner scott i have no worries about I think he's an absolutely electric reliever, and I think 29 teams will be calling. Or maybe not 29, because not all of them will be buying, but you understand what I'm saying. Yes. He's the one why I have absolutely no concern about. How do teams value Trevor Rogers? How do they value Josh Bell? How do potentially, how do they value Jake Berger? How do they yeah. value some of the bullpen arms that you're talking about, whether that be Andrew Nardi or the rest of them? How, huh. how are those, what does the market think of them? Because if they don't think anything of them, it makes sense for the Marlins to trade all of them, but they might get nothing. So then yeah. you put Peter Bendix in a corner saying, we need to get these guys off the books, but nobody wants to take them. And I don't want to just DFA them because they're too good to DFA. So that's my burning question. What does the market think about these Marlins guys? Yeah, yeah it's a good point because a lot of them are, are tweeners, right? Yeah. I mean, Jazz, you're getting years of control, which helps. But yeah. at the same time, it's not like he's lighting the world on fire. It's nice that he, I think he's a good, I think he's a better second baseman by a good margin than he is a center fielder, but at least you have that positional versatility here. At the same time, he's kind of a tweener defensively. He has not really put together a, a substantially strong stretch other than that first little half before he got hurt, where he looked like an all-star uh, and wasn't an all-star basically. But th that's kind of the question. I agree. It's like, what is the value of Jazz Chisholm? And, and it, it's going to be really interesting to see what that looks like. But to your point, like, it would have been really easy to get a, a huge return for Jesus Lazardo. That's not possible now that he's hurt. It would have been easy, I think, to get a pretty substantial return for Braxton Garrett, given what he's done the last couple of years. That's not going to happen because he's hurt. So they're not really able to cash in, I think, to the degree that they were hoping. And I think it's even more reason now that they're going to have to move the pieces that any team has some interest in. And to your point, you got to make sure that's that's not underselling them as well. So it's it's a really interesting spot for Bendix to be in. And I think it's going to say a lot to see how he, he maneuvers it. And I'm excited to see how he does that. Let's move on to the Washington nationals last team in the national league East. I got to be honest. I only have one burning question and it's really just a, I want to watch this guy play every day. <laughs> I want to see how James Wood, his second half looks like. I just want to see this guy. There's not going to be a ton of pressure on him. You know that you're a part of the Nationals' future. He's been grounding out a lot. A lot of his batted balls have been on the ground. What does he look like when he starts elevating? Because you know at some point he's going to figure it out. He's so yeah. young. He's 21 years old. right? I, I remember I was watching the game with my girlfriend. This is the first game where he had a home run. And I say, how old is this guy? 
And she goes, what, 27, 28? He's 21 years old. He's five years younger than us. Look at, he just looks like talent. Like yes. when I look at Ellie De La Cruz, when I look at O'Neill Cruz, when I look at Aaron Judge, like these guys are just Same freaks clock. of nature that we don't get to see a lot in Major League Baseball, but now they're all coming. So exciting to watch. My TV is going to have the Nationals games on a lot, and it's just watching that freak of nature in James Wood. To take it a step further, that's my question was kind of built on that and then building it forward is, is does the youth movement reach its pinnacle this season? Because you got Dylan Cruz kicking in Rochester right now in AAA, and you got uh, Brady House, who just was promoted to AAA as well. He so looks good. He looks he real hits good. Bombs. Yeah. He hits absolute bombs, and he's a great defender at third. Dylan Cruz is a superb center fielder. So those are guys that could probably – handle it sooner rather than later. I think they've got some things to work out in triple a, but at the same time, like if it's August and you know, the season's already gone, these guys are just playing in triple a, why not get them a big league opportunity here and, and, and expedite that development process. And this could be a young team next year that if Cruz and house and, you know, some of these young guys and wood start to really settle in, they could be that fun su- surprising team because the pitching's coming together too. So I would love to see them expedite this process a little bit more. And to your point, like if Wood is up there, which he already is, but if Cruz is up there with him, House is up there. I love watching Mackenzie Gore throw. I I will be tapped into this team frequently. I love CJ Abrams, who's like the old guy now compared to these dudes. Like I am, I'm really excited about the future here. And I hope that they lean into it now instead of having to wait till next year to see all these young guys together. I think Nationals fans deserve a little bit of an appetizer to the main course that I think will be next year's youth movement appetizer to the main course of next year's youth movement that is a bar and that probably fired up some nationals fans before we fire up some national league central fans let's take a quick break national league central one burning question for every team we'll start at the top with the milwaukee brewers my burning question is i don't think it's mean but it's my question does the do the Brewers want to win the World Series? <laughs> they have question. the same one. <laughs> this is the exact same one. But it's basically how serious are you? <laughs> exactly. It's not like I think that you're gonna win the division if you do absolutely nothing. I do. Um, I think the Cardinals are are a pretty good squad. I think the Reds are exciting. I think the Pirates have some fun pieces, and I think the Cubs are pretty decent. We'll see what they do, and we're gonna talk about them obviously in a minute. And I think the Brewers know this. They're gonna get Devin Williams back. Aaron Savali look, has looked good for them so far. They got rid of Dallas Keuchel. Um, shout out Dallas Keuchel. This team is good enough to win the division. But, I mean, Jack's thoughts about the rotation come playoff time, they're sitting with me. I'm not going to lie. That's, I mean, if we're going Freddie Peralta, Tobias Myers, Aaron Savali, Colin Ray – you're not going to win a playoff series. I'm sorry. Maybe you do. No. Maybe you shock me, and it would be awesome to do so. But you guys weren't winning playoff series, if we're being honest with each other, when you had Burns, Woodruff, and Freddie. It's tough come playoff time. And now anything could happen, but is this Brewers team okay with the win a division? Not a lot of people pick them. Shout out myself. I did pick them. Patting myself on the back right now, but of course, it could come crashing down. And if that's okay... They're not going to spend a ton of money. They won another division crown. Maybe go back to the drawing board next year. Or they have the farm system to go get some big pieces and say, yeah, we just traded Corbin Burns. Padres trade Juan Soto. They're going to buy. Why can't you do it? So that's my burning question for them. Do you want to win a World Series? Are you okay winning the division and seeing what happens? I I mean, it's it's just the the most – I think this might be one of the most burning questions of all of the burning questions. Like – I, everyone is dying to see what it looks like for the Brewers to go all in or, or, or even just go like half in. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's so frustrating to, to watch a team that, I mean, they've done a phenomenal job of building this, this roster. And I get it. A big part of that is by not depleting the farm all the time. At the same time, you don't have to deplete the farm. This is one of the best farm systems in major league baseball. I think they killed the draft again in terms of accumulating value. They continue to do that. Uh, and guys are developing. I, I could do a whole episode on on just the Brewers farm, and they've got guys coming up, and and even the complex that 
I think are going to be incredible. But I was just showing you guys all week about Jesus Made over in the DSL. That guy looks like he could be an alien. He might be the next big thing. And I'll talk about him more in the future. But the point being, like, they've got talent all over from upper minors, lower minors, and everywhere in between. And you have a rotation that you went through it. I mean, they're they're pitching fine enough. Yeah. But it's 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 mostly because the bullpen is yeah. able to take over early. At the first sign of danger, we're taking them out. And, and we're going to our bullpen, which is one of baseball's best, and it's going to get even better when you add Devin Williams. That's great, but you can't win a postseason series that way. You need starting pitching. And that, that to me, is, is crazy because we're talking about all these other teams where it's like, okay, how are you going to add offense? It's such a thin market for offense. It's not a thin market for pitching. Nope. And I know pitching is always going to be very expensive, but, like, I, I know I just have a feeling that they're just going to go get Eric Fetty and call it a day. And, like, that is – but that like, is so the thing frustrating is, to me. A lot of teams need an Eric Fetty. So why would it be the Brewers among all these teams that would get Eric Fetty? Like it, it makes the most sense for an Eric Fetty, but there's a lot of teams it makes sense for. Maybe they pay more than the Brewers. So it may not even be an Eric Fetty. I don't think that we could just hand them Fetty because it makes sense when other teams need him. I agree. And again, like, are you going to actually push the chips forward? Because you don't waste a, a Christian Yelich season like this, where Christian yeah. Yelich is playing like prime Yelich and maybe not as many homers, but okay. He's still slugging 521. He's hitting 326. You have Wilson or William Contreras, excuse me, looking like one of the best catchers in baseball. Bryce Terang looks like a really fun young piece. Adamas is back and playing well. Like you have Jackson Chorio now looking like Jackson Chorio as he's settled in, by the way, only 20 years old and going to be 20 for the rest of the year. Like he's starting to look like a piece and, and the, the piece that everybody always knew he would be. Not even mention Joey Ortiz and other guys. I can go through the whole roster resource. Like, go get an arm or two, man. Like, you could win the World Series or at least get to the NLCS and square off with the Phillies and give the Brewers fans more excitement than they've had in a long time. It's just, it's frustrating to see them stagnant. So I, I hope this is a little bit different this year where they feel like they can kind of uh, make make some noise here. I hope they do because I hope they really go for it because this bullpen is so good. This offense is so good. They're the National League Guardians. It's a very similar conversation. Yes, you can win the division. You can win regular season games with your current roster. I don't, I'm not debating that. Arm's not debating that. Maybe Jack's debating that. But most people are not debating that you can win during the regular season. That's not our burning question. Our burning question is do you want to win the World Series? Let's see what they do. But let's move on to the St. Louis Cardinals, and the floor is yours. Kind of a similar thing. Are you going to pretend that Michaelis Lynn and Gibson should be getting the ball in the playoffs? That's pretty much my question. I Those guys have held up their end of the bargain. They've been fine. They've been really solid, I think, overall. And great additions to get through a regular season. That's awesome. Yes. But we talk about it all the time. There's re solid regular season pitchers, and then there's guys, there's horses in the postseason. They have one. And then I don't even know what it looks like after that in game two, game three. And, of course, the Cardinals, it's playoffs or bust. That's how it is every single year. We know that they want to win. But similarly here, and if you're the Brewers also, are you going to let the Cardinals maybe go get an arm instead and, and, and catch up to you? Like, that's that's another side of it. These two teams are kind of in a similar conversation here, but the Cardinals we know will be a little bit more aggressive, though they are frustrating with the pitching sometimes. You cannot pretend that you are even giving it the old college try with that rotation. No one in their right minds thinks that rotation is going to be able to win you a playoff series. It just, it can't. It won't, and, and I will happily you know, eat those words if they somehow do make some noise there. Cause I do like the Cardinals, but like, let's be realistic here. I Mose, like you've been around for a while, man. You can't be looking at that rotation and saying, Oh yeah. Like I, I think Lance Lynn could get the ball game two or Gibson in game three. And, and we can match up with the Phillies and, 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 you know, makes, make some noise. Yeah. Like Aaron Nola versus Lance Lynn, like in the bank. I mean, like you're losing that game. I mean, I'll, I'll be wrong here, you know, hand up, but I think, Happily. Ranger Suarez versus Kyle Gibson. I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, you could go with all, even <clears throat> if they were to go into a matchup with the Brewers. Brewers got the better bullpen. They got the better offense. And yeah, they might have a slightly like Tobias Myers versus Lance Lynn. I'll still take the Brewers easily. Turning into a bullpen game anyways. <laughs> exactly. Um, my burning question, though, has nothing to do with the deadline with them. Because I, I kind of share the same sentiment. But at the same time, that isn't burning for me. Like, I just feel like we kind of, it is what it is. They might add an arm, they might not. And that's just what we've been dealing with the Cardinals for a long time. So for me, 
My burning question is, what the hell is going to happen with Jordan Walker? That is my oh. burning question. Because I cannot believe what has happened. That's a good one. In 2023, we it's like the media or Cardinals fans, I don't know, but the message is that he was terrible last year. When he put up a 116 WRC+, plus and he had 16 home runs in 117 games. Now, I understand that wasn't pure electricity. But at 21 years old, he had While well, learning a new position. While well, learning a new position, and he wasn't striking out that much. He visibly showed you that he has potential. Then he comes up this year. Only plays 20 games, and I know that they were terrible. I know that he hit 155. I knew that it was there was really no semblance of offense there. But he's 22 years old, and it was his first 20 games. Can you give the man a damn second? And then you throw him down to the minor leagues, crushing his confidence most likely, and he's not hitting down there in the minor leagues. No. So now what is your plan? He put up, as a 21-year-old, he was 16% better than the league average hitter. As a 21-year-old. And what do you do when he struggles in 20 games? You send him down. What is now your plan? That is my burning question. I I, I love that because it's he's almost become like a little bit of like a I almost forget sometimes. With, yeah. Like that they've got him there, and to, to to build on the point of what he did last year, man, like the second half was even more impressive. Like he he was slow in the first half, and I think that's kind of what led you know, it left like a, a little bit of a. a a bad taste at in 21 years mouth old. To fit. at 21 while learning a bad first half in his first couple of games in major league baseball and then they gave him you know 20 games at the big league level this year to to try to figure it out and then send him right down to triple a where now i mean i've watched his ab's down there like yes he's got some mechanical things going around he's honestly regressed so because you know, there were some mechanical adjustments he made in the second half i wrote about it I loved him. He looked awesome. And, and again, we saw the results of him making those adjustments. And then I think just through the, the mental battle of everything and, and just trying to survive and trying to get back up there and pressing and not really knowing now totally what's wrong. And, you know, we know that they've had some issues with, with trying to get guys right. I know they like to send them in Memphis to do that. It just was, it was, it was really surprising to me. So I, I'm curious. I don't think they use him as a trade chip because, you know, you wouldn't want to sell at the bottom of his value and he's still so young and talented, but it just seems like this whole situation has been handled pretty weird and it, it's frustrating and disappointing. I, I am very curious to see what they do and, and how they handle it. I, I think that's a great one. Let's move on to the Chicago Cubs here. And my burning question is more, I'm more shocked at a position as at a specific position. Yeah. What are the Cubs doing at catcher? <laughs> I I queued it up on fan graphs and I looked at teams just from the total catching position, not just like, Oh, this is their starting catcher. Who are the worst starting catchers? I looked at all the production from catcher from the Cubs, comparing it to the rest of the league. There are two teams who have a negative 1.5 war from their catching position. The Chicago White Sox, who just DFA'd Martin Maldonado, and the Chicago Cubs. There are two teams with a WRC plus below 45. The Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Cubs. Actually, excuse me, there are three teams. The Miami Marlins are also in there. Yeah, I was saying, the Marlins. Yes. I, was, I, was, I was about to be shocked. It's like, oh, they must have had a couple of good White games on the stretch there. I think you had a tweet a couple of weeks ago, like, Rays, we're still doing this with Alex yeah. Jackson. Oh, they're better than the Cubs. Miguel Amaya, Tomas Nito, Jan Gomes is gone. Like, these guys cannot be catchers for a playoff team. I'm sorry. If you're looking at worst pop times, Miguel Amaya comes up. You're looking at framing metrics. It's these same guys. They can't hit. They can't field at a premium, premium position. We just had Ryan Finkelstein on talking about Francisco Alvarez and how much he has influenced these pitchers, how much better these pitchers are when he's behind home plate. You see what a good catcher can do. We talk about the Orioles, how they just never get swept, uh, even though, you know, what's so funny. They got swept by the Cubs. That's just the most baseball thing ever. But yes. the catching position is so, so, so important. And the Cubs who are trying to make the playoffs have the same catching situation as two of the worst teams in Major League Baseball. Is it? Are you going to go trade? Are you sticking with what you got? Are you bringing somebody up? What are you going to do with this premium position, Chicago? 
I would have a revolving door of backups behind Amaya and just audition guys. Shit, dude. I would at this point, I would try Sandy Leone out there. Try anything. Um, I, like anything. At least yeah, if you're not gonna get offense from the position, like you mentioned, like get somebody that's gonna call a great game. Yeah. It's gonna limit the run game, who's gonna defend. Literally well. go get Austin Hedges. I mean, the Guardians will never give him up. No. Yeah. For a reason. But at the same time, like you need at least have a really good defender back there. Maybe he can't hit a lick, but it's if he can't hit a lick, that's the same as Miguel Amaya and Tomas Nito anyway. Yeah. No, it's that's that's the most insane part. Um I, I would love to see them just try revolving door of backup catchers at this point. I, I think that's a, a really important point. And I, I think sticking to that, my question was was a position specifically too, but there's nothing you're gonna change about this. It's gotta be the player himself. We're talking about two really important positions here. Can Dancy Swanson turn it around? Th- this dude is 20th among qualified shortstops in WRC plus. Danzy Swanson's making way too much money to be 20th in WRC plus. Um, I think it's 79 is where he's at right now. I know that it's not just Danzy Swanson and you've got a lot of guys that could be swinging it a little bit better, but at the same time, he's the guy that's the furthest off from his career averages. I mean, and just really has been again, like an automatic out through stretches and just has been really frustrating. It's great. The defense is still there. That's fantastic. But you could look at a Cody Bellinger and say, well, he needs to pick it up too. He's still above league average. I mean, I think at this point you're just saying, can you get league average offense from somebody like Dan C. Swanson? I think that would help a ton. Say a Suzuki's raking. Ian Happ's doing his thing where he has like two and a half war every single year. Like everyone else on the veteran side, I think for the most part is doing their job. It just feels like Dan C. Swanson. I don't want to single out one guy. The catching position has been huge. Third base has been a big problem. Morell has been disappointing. Uh, but at the same time, like, I do feel as though Dansby Swanson has been one of the heaviest weights holding this Cubs team down so far this year. Move on to the side from the bullpen though. Sorry. I should say the bullpen's the biggest problem, but yeah. And I'm sure Cubs fans kind of want us to put us them in the grouping of what are they going to do? Are they going to be buyers or sellers? Like Cubs fans, this team is worse than last year. And you bought last year and didn't make the playoffs. Are we buying again? Because if I'm that front office, I'm definitely going to be hesitant here. Because this team, unless they get crazy hot over the next three weeks and catapult themselves, which is possible, and we'll be having different conversations if they do that. But damn it, if I'm the Cubs front office, I got to see that. I got to see you guys go crazy over the next three weeks. Not just not just go, you know, 14 and 10 over the next 24 games, let's say until the trade deadline. I don't know if it's exact. That might be actually be overselling it because the trade deadline's coming up. So maybe I don't even know what it would be, but you guys got to go crazy for me to even think about buying because then what does buying look like? Are we getting two starting pitchers and three bullpen arms and a bat? I don't know. Well, and remember, so that's too- not my burning question for the Cubs. Well, remember too, they got really hot around this time last year, which yeah. led them to buy because we're having the same conversation. They buy or sell. They invested in the team a little bit more this year. They clearly want to win and they end up having, but that might almost leave a sour taste in their mouth in terms of trying to do that again. So I, I think they probably stand pat. They definitely shouldn't sell, especially with the way Cubs fans are. Like if someone overwhelms you for a Bellinger or something like that, and where, you know, he's not a long-term piece, you're still hoping that PCA and, and Casey and those guys are all going to be, you know, a part of the future now and and moving into next year. But I mean, I, I I'm not aggressively adding to this team at yeah. this point. I think they're going to have to really show something in the next two weeks, like you said. The floor is yours for the Cincinnati Reds. So I, this was one of the teams that was kind of harder for me to 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 figure out. Me too. Um, you know, you could talk about Ellie, but I already think he's really picked it up and it's looked really good. I think. Really, the biggest question with them is, in a light trade market, do they decide to move India? Because Mm. Jonathan India is playing out of his mind right now. It has been a frustrating couple seasons. He's been fine, but he hasn't been the guy that was the rookie of the year. He hasn't been the guy that, you know, looked like he could be, you know, a big piece for them. I think it's very clear that he's not going to get an extension. He's going to be, he's under control for one more year after this one. But India's got an 800 OPS. We've talked about the light market. Of course, he's playing a huge part in their ability to even hang remotely close to the race. But I think if you look at it from this lens, 
Okay, you just got Noel Marte back. Uh, you, you're hoping to get Matt McClain back before the end of the year. I'm not sure if you will. But at the same time, like you could end up holding on to India. If you don't move him in the offseason, you start next year, and he's just kind of back to struggling or just kind of being that barely league average guy with lack of defensive value. All of a sudden, you're probably kicking yourself for not moving him. A team would probably give up a decent amount for a year and a half of control. The Reds have notoriously kind of not cashed in in those spots. Uh, but I also do want to see them keep it intact and go for it. That said, like, I think India in particular is the name I'm kind of circling here and saying, what's their plan? What are you going to do with him? Uh, because they kind of have to figure that out. Absolutely. And it's so funny because you said, I don't really want to focus on Ellie. My burning question is about India. And in my brain, I was like, I don't know how consequential it is if the Reds do trade India or don't. I think that he helps the team this year. I think if they trade him, they'll get a decent sized package for him. And I think that's kind of it. I am focused on the Ellie De La Cruz show. And the way I'm focusing in on him is, could this guy go 30-80 this year? Yeah. 17 home runs, 46 stolen bases. And it's not 46 stolen bases with 20 caught stealings. He's not just stealing every single time. If you look at BSR, which is a base running stat on fan graphs, he is one of the best base runners in Major League Baseball. The way that he can wreck havocs on the base pass is incredible. You just don't see that much. I think it's better than what Acuna was doing with the Braves last year. Because the stealing third is just absurd. But Acuna did go 30-70, right? He stole 73 bases last year. Ellie De La Cruz had 46 at the break. And with the way the Reds are playing too, their offense runs on Ellie De La Cruz running. So he's going to continue to do that. I think he can get to 30 home runs, and I think he could get to 80 stolen bases be the first in MLB history. And if he does that, we're going to have some interesting conversations about him for MVP because if we're looking at the F-war totals in the National League, he's right behind Shohei. He's ahead of Bryce Harper right now. Now, Harper obviously missed some time, so that's going to factor into it. But the voters don't care. Elliot De La Cruz has a higher F4. And if he goes 30-80 and keeps playing great defense, which is a take that we should do an episode of takes we want to walk back. I at one point said Elliot De La Cruz, I don't think he's going to be a great defender. Wrong. He's been fantastic as a defender. And that's a testament to him. And that's oh, yeah. things we love to be wrong about. Right. If someone proves us wrong, we say they're going to be bad. They're going to be good. Good. Prove me wrong. Great it's his work, life. Ellie. Literally. <laughs> it's his life. It's my take. <laughs> Who gives a shit about me talking on a mic when Ellie De La Cruz is improving as a ball player? He is incredible right now. So that's my burning question is, can Ellie achieve history with 3080? You know, it's crazy. It's like, you know how long I've just been obsessed with, with this baseball player here in Ellie De La Cruz. I almost expect it. Like I almost just was like, I, I think he's going to go do that. Cause it's not just that he's on pace for that. He was like in overdrive over the last 30 games, last 30 games going into the all-star break, get a nine ninety OPS. Yeah. I, I still cannot believe that people were out there calling this man a bust, saying he's overrated. He's overhyped MLB, you know, gives him way too much love and, and whatever, like look at the K rate. He's going to be streaky all the time, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he might be a streaky hitter. A lot of hitters are streaky. A lot of hitters but at the end, streaky. Of, let's see what it looks like at the end of the year. And what it looks like at the end of the year might be 30 80. So please, like, I, I hate that contrarian ass shit. Like, that drives me nuts. And I see so many people victory lapping every time he goes like 20 games with, with a 40% K rate. Like, oh no, guy with six foot five frame and long levers got out of whack for two weeks. Like, yeah. oh, he's cooked. He's 22 and he does everything. Um, So that's a good one. And then one other that I did consider was, can we see the green Lodolo duo? And I know Abbott has been awesome too, but can we see the green Lodolo duo healthy together for the rest of the second half here? Because that would get me a lot more jazzed up for next year when you have Abbott there too. And, and you know what the offense can be when all the guys are healthy. So I would love to see Lodolo stay on the field. I think that's a huge part of this for the Reds as well in the second half. 100%. Let's move on to the Pittsburgh Pirates. And my burning question is probably the same as yours, but... I mean, how could you not watch a Pirates game and think the same thing? What is the Pirates' plan for Paul Skeens? Yep. Are they just letting him run for the rest of the year? We're going to give you as many as 100 pitches, right? Derek Shelton. And I think every front office would feel the same, and every manager in that position would feel the same. Yes. 
for example, I tweeted out, please give Paul Skeens the rest of this game. As a from a fan perspective, I understand that you're not gonna throw up 120 pitches in his it is rookie year. I get it. Now, would I have liked it? Sure, but it's not about me. It's about the Pirates. And what are they going to do? Is it Paul Skeens throws five more starts, then they send him down and they say, Yeah, we want to control your innings. Look how good you are, dude. We are not going to mess you up. Could that mess him up by sending him down, not giving him a full workload? I don't know. That's my burning question. What is the Pirates' plan with Paul Skeens? How long is the leash? Right? Yeah. I mean, this is a team that's that's in the hunt. They and are. I I mean, I don't expect them to do it, but you know, you 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 can't. I I can't emphasize enough. And watching a small market like the Marlins, even, but I think the Pirates would be even even more of a, a an example of this. And you'd see fans really showing up, and you already are when Skeens throws. But playing meaningful games in September, even if you don't make the playoffs, is so valuable to building momentum into the next year, to getting people to actually show up in September, to get people to just give a shit about your team moving forward and stay tuned in in the off season. Like these are all important things. And the Pirates, you know. I think this is a point where they can actually do that and they can build a lot of excitement going into next year and what could be the most exciting you know, young rotation in baseball, potentially headlined by Skeens and Jones. So I, I would love to see what that looks like. But, you know, at the same time, you want to be careful with Skeens. And I understand that for all the same reasons you said, like this guy is the franchise. He is the franchise. He is everything for you. And he's more than that. He is he is the the face of what I think the future of MLB can be given the marketability that he has and how many people know him. He's transcendent. I always look at guys that like, if he's on house of highlights, he's transcendent. Like they never post about baseball and Paul Skeens is on there all the time. Like that's a transcendent guy, but to fill in on what you're saying, because of course I had the same question. He's already at 66 and a third innings at the big league level this year. He threw 27 and a third in triple a last year. He threw 130 innings. If you include uh, the the handful that he threw at the professional ranks, but I think it was 123 and a, and a third in college. I mean, it, it, but based on that, they if they if they're looking at 130 is the cap, like he's not gonna finish the year all the way through. I don't think 130 should be the cap because remember, like those were 130 taxing innings where you know, a lot of times he was throwing 120 plus pitches, even when he wasn't being efficient, they were still running him out there. Whereas in this case. It, the innings have been a little bit lower impact and he hasn't thrown any innings where he's already over a hundred pitches. I don't know how many innings last year in college were thrown after he eclipsed a hundred pitches, but I guarantee it was a lot. And you know, for sure it was a lot more than this year. It's pretty much zero this year. Um, I think they can run him up to 150. I just, we don't know. And they haven't said anything. And I think it's because they don't know yet either. And I think it's really going to be a play it by ear thing. If they see one thing look a little bit off, if his VLO is down a half tick, they might just say, okay, this is enough. Let's, let's slow this thing down. So I think Skeens knows that too. And I think he's going to do everything in his power to show I'm perfectly fine. You don't need to slow me down. I'm stronger actually now. Uh, so I, I'm very fascinated by this whole situation because you know, Major League Baseball, they want him healthy, but they also want him on the field too. So it's going to be it's going to be very fascinating to see how this unfolds. And we got to mention this again for all you NL Central fans that just heard this. We mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, but if you skip through and all you were listening to is the NL Central part, we are doing a five stadium tour. We are going to be in Milwaukee, in Chicago, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, and Chicago. All of the five cities in the National League Central from July 29th to August 2nd. We're going to be going to all those games. It's a road trip. Code Just Baseball, $5 off your tickets. You can find that link in the episode description. We would love for all of our NL Central fans and fans of other teams, if you want to just come out to games with us, if you're in that area, come through. It's going to be such a fun time. We're just going to be hanging out, talking baseball the whole nine yards watching games together. So make sure if you want to be a part of our NL Central Stadium Tour, five games in five days, the dates are there. The link is in the episode description. The link is also in our link tree if you are on social media. So before we get to the National League East, let's take another quick break. Excuse me. We're moving on to the National League West. <laughs> we got the Dodgers, the Diamondbacks, the Padres, the Giants, and the Rockies. I'll start with the Dodgers. With them... I know that they're going to be aggressive at the deadline. My burning question is just what's going to happen with this rotation? Because if you look at the IL rotation, it's absolutely elite. Our friend Walker Bueller is unfortunately on there. Yamamoto, Glass now is on 
is on there. Sheehan, you can just go down the line. There's so many arms that are fantastic. Technically, you could say Shohei Otani for next year's rotation is technically on the IL, you know, still rehabbing from his elbow. So what do we do now? Like James Paxton is making a lot of starts here for the Los Angeles Dodgers. And they were really, really crappy going into the All-Star break. Blowing leads to the Tigers consistently. Now, shout out the Tigers for showing the fight there. But damn it, you're the Los Angeles Dodgers. And now that doesn't have to do exactly with the rotation. More talking about the pitching in general. But I'm giving the bullpen a pass because they've been so unbelievably good. And just in a couple of games before the All-Star break, they had some blows. But I'm not worried about that bullpen. They have been so good. But I am really worried about the rotation. So does that mean that the Dodgers go crazy? They've been in talks with Ter- with the Tigers and Tarek Skubal. They've been in talks with the White Sox and Garrett Crochet. I assume they've been in talks with a lot of teams who have starting pitchers that may be willing to move off of them. Do they go big? Do they get two arms? Do they get one big one? Do they say, we don't really want to trade from our system. We know that these guys are going to come back. What do they do? I'm not sure. That's my burning question. Yeah, I mean, the pitching is is fascinating because if not for Gavin Stone and Landon Knack, who both have three twos and have combined for 120 plus innings, specifically Gavin Stone, who has been awesome this year in 96 and two thirds, like, where is this team? Like, how are they surviving from a pitching perspective if not for those guys? River Ryan is going to come up um, in, in a week or so, probably a little bit less, uh, to, to make his big league debut. He's good. <laughs> River Ryan's got some special stuff, and, but he's a rookie. And he's coming off of an injury at a little bit of a shoulder issue in the early part of the year, delayed start here. And and now is, is getting ramped back up. I'm so positive that river Ryan's going to make a start in the next couple of days that uh, they, they had him throw at the complex. He was in triple a and they had him throw at the complex during the all-star break. So he could stay on track to make his big league debut. So it's coming. I think he's gonna be the first guy uh, to go from the complex to the big leagues, making his debut uh, back to back starts. I'm sure someone else has done it, but I can't think of another one, but again, now, now we're looking at, Knack, basically a rookie. Stone, basically a rookie. And then Robleski, Robleski, who's been pitching, basically a rookie. And then River Ryan, rookie. And then James Paxton. That's crazy. Um, so I agree with you. That is a big one for me. But then the other thing that I'm looking at is with Mookie Betts on the shelf with the with the broken hand, what is your middle infield? Like Miguel Rojas has been good and, and testament to him. And that's been a great acquisition for them because he has been in the best insurance policy possible uh, whenever they need him. Great defender. He's 35. And, you know, he could easily slow down in the back half of the year uh, as, as we go down the stretch here. But also, it's not just Rojas filling in at shortstop. It, second base is is gross. I don't, like, their second base position is gross. You have Gavin Lux playing there most of the time. You got Chris Taylor getting run there. Um, Kike Hernandez getting run there. I just, that's crazy that this that's what the middle infield looks like. And I get it. Mookie's been hurt. But even when Mookie comes back, like, are you just rolling with Rojas the rest of the way? Or are you putting Mookie back at short and then just still just kind of ignoring the second base position and just rotating all of these underwhelming guys? Or does Rojas play there? Like, I, I just thought they would aim a little bit higher. And I think they would aim a little bit higher. But also, to your point, they got to worry about the pitching side of things, too. So the middle infield may be an afterthought. I, I'm just curious what the priority is. Should probably be pitching, but they should be looking at this middle infield situation, too. Crazy that you can spend a billion dollars in an off season and still have all of these question marks. That's why baseball is so tough. It's yep. tough because these guys and get hurt. All the people that were saying, why bother playing the season? The Dodgers are ruining baseball, blah, 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 blah. Exactly. This is why you play the games. This is why you play the games. And this is why no matter what, they can sign everybody under the sun. You got to play the games. It's not played on a computer here, folks. So I do want to hear from all the people bitching preseason. I'm not watching baseball anymore. Then they're doing good. Just whiners, all of you. Yeah. Look at this. Look at what's happening right now. Does anybody have pure confidence in the Dodgers beating the Phillies, even the Braves? It, uh, it, we saw that the Brewers are playing them tough too. And that was when some of the arms were healthy. So let's move on to the Arizona Diamondbacks. For them, it's a it's a simple one. Hmm. Are the Diamondbacks going to buy, sell, or stand pat? I don't know. I genuinely have no idea. If we're talking about infielders being needed by teams at the deadline, they have a few that they could trade from. Maybe you now move off of Geraldo Perdomo because you do have Jordan Lawler at some point. 
And then you could just mask it for the rest of the season if you're not going for it. You could trade Christian Walker as well. Potentially A. Eugenio Suarez is on the is on the block. Now, Cattel Marte, he ain't going nowhere for good reason. But the Dynamax have a lot of great players that a lot of teams would want. They can cash in. Farm system would be so much better. And the farm system is all already good. Or are they now just a few pieces away from making another run here? Because they've yeah. been playing better too. Or does the front office say, eh, it's expensive to go get big pieces. We still think that once everybody's healthy, right? Merrill Kelly is going to return at some point. Gallon just returned. Eduardo Rodriguez is still not here. So we're going to get back reinforcements. Seawald came back a little while ago. So now the bullpen is looking better. And you see the emergence of Justin Martinez, who is a freaking monster. You still have Ginkle. You still have guys back there too. So this team, even as currently constructed, can do some damage. But they can get better. They can also sell. They're in, I think, potentially the most interesting spot of any National League team come deadline time. Yeah. And I mean, and I think they have all the reasons in the world to either cautiously add and definitely stand pat for what what you laid out. And like Jordan Montgomery, you hope maybe this little knee inflammation IL stint you know, gets him reset and he comes back and, and looks better. But there's just so many different ways that the rotation can get better with all the names that you mentioned. My big burning question, though, is what does Car- Corbin Carroll look like? Can he figure it out? Uh, it, it's just it's getting to the point now where I feel like we're, we're bordering on, on Einstein's definition of insanity. I haven't seen the swing change much. Bizarre. I haven't seen a tangible adjustment and the D backs, like I, I tell you, like, I think this is one of their biggest issues. I think they scout pretty well. I think that they do a pretty good job uh, on the analytical side, especially now. I don't think they do a good job from the mechanical side of things and helping guys get right. And I have a million examples in the minor leagues of that. And, and, and some examples in the big weeks, just veterans that have not been able to turn it around when they lose it. But I mean, Corbin Carroll is, is your franchise cornerstone. He should be the, the utmost priority. And he is. And also the, the prospect that should be your utmost priority, Drew Jones, both of those guys at the same time have had swing issues. Drew Jones is way worse, obviously, but like, I've had swinging issues and you haven't really seen any mechanical adjustment there at all. And for Carol, it's just like, at what point do you really try to make a substantial change knowing that, Hey, I have a 635 OPS and I know he's been a little bit better, but every time he gets a little bit better, it's kind of right back to eh again. And I know like you can look at the last 30 games of 758 OPS. That's still not Corbin Carroll. Yeah, like are we supposed to look at that and say, oh, we're on the up and up at a 758 OPS? I looked at the same metrics and I I was thinking about putting Carroll in this and and that's a great burning question, but I was like, I I don't know if I see it this year. Maybe it's just a lost year. I think it might be a lost year because I think this is, it's clear that like he's going to need to spend an off season working with a third party rather than the D-backs because just seems like they can't quite get him right. And I don't know if it's him not being willing to make any major adjustments. I know it's hard to do that during the year, but it should be a hell of a lot easier when you get a 630 OPS. Uh, again, it's been better, but at the same time, it still doesn't look great. And if this team's going to do anything, I think Corbin Carroll has got to be a hell of a lot better. Great. Let's move on to the San Diego Padres. I think I accidentally stole the first two going first. So you got the next two. So you got the Padres. Go ahead. Uh, the floor is yours. Do we see Preller in his final form? Mm, that was mine exact question. Mine is, what does a make-or-break year look like for AJ Preller? Every year is a make-or-break year for this crazy dude. And now it really is. Um, you know, with with Seidler, unfortunately, passing away, and that was like his biggest advocate, apparently. Um, with you know, just the, the, the frustration and, and relative underachieving that you've seen with how aggressive he has been there's a real chance that if they don't make the playoffs, he doesn't have a job next year. And, and I know Prower is aware of that. So what does that look like when he knows that the farm system, who cares what it looks like when he's gone? He never even cared before. He's really good at reloading it. I love the draft picks this year. It is, it is this, funny. In a make or break year, he already did care about it. I think that's such a funny point that you just made. Like, You're right. Like he already did care about it. Now what is he going to do? If I had a deal in place with the Dodgers for Scooble or whatever, I would give AJ Preller the opportunity to match every single time. Every time. He should because, be getting matching calls every single day when there's a trade on the line. Because I, I think that there's as long as they play decent, you know, down the stretch here, 
and with the Dodgers looking relatively fragile, you know, and and they're still really good and they're still one of the teams to beat. Yeah. But like with it, with it looking like they can, you know, make some, I mean, the Mets have a playoff spot right now. Like there's, there's no reason why the Padres couldn't go grab a spot there. I, I, I could see him getting reckless. Um, and I just, I just want to see if he does that, knowing that he's on the hot seat. And I don't mean to skip past the Padres and not give them enough time here, but I don't have anything to add. Yeah. It's the exact same thing. And I think it's the exact same thing for Padres fans. And we're all just sitting here waiting to see what this, this man does. And, you know, we, we make fun of him being a psychopath in the sense of, you know, trading for everybody under the sun, trading Juan Soto, they're going to get Dylan Cease. Just he's... He's an insane man in the market, but the way that this guy identifies talent, like, yes, if the Padres don't make the playoffs, like he may lose his job, but he is as good of a scout, as good as a talent evaluator as we have in major league baseball. So he's certainly going to get a job. He's going to be fine, but another GM job is interesting. Will another team trust that we bring this guy in and he's going to change the fortunes of our team. We know that he could build a farm system, but we know that he's going to just going to trade them as soon as they end up being any good. Yep. So he's going to make a break. Can I be a GM again? Or am I going to be the best scout for every team? Which is fine. Yep. But do you still want to be a GM? I'm going to give you the floor for the Giants again because I sold Dodgers and D-backs for you. So go ahead, San Francisco Giants. The Giants are just such a fascinating one to me too because the, in three games under – but at the same time, there is some talent here. They do have some pieces. I, I, I'm just looking at Blake Snell. And what does Blake Snell look like down the stretch? That's my big question because I think it's 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 on multiple fronts. Of you know, One, you know, Blake Snell throwing like Blake Snell could catapult this team, you know, back into the conversation here as you know, it is relatively wide open. Blake Snell also had his best start of the year uh, going into the break and was phenomenal. And all the underlying metrics – points towards him being a lot better than he has been through his you know eight starts so far this year but remember also this is a unique contract where he has a player option for next year if he really shoves the rest of the way he might just opt out um so i'm just really fascinated through that lens too because one how blake snell performs is a huge indicator on on you know the giants just having their their last gasp here to try to get back into it but also how blake snell performs it can be very uh, important in deciding whether he will be on the free agent market again next year. Uh, and, and I think that would be a pretty big deal to have him back in, you know, on that market and, and, and have another high upside arm in the fold, especially after what he did last year. Yeah. Mine is more looking at the giants at a macro because I agree with you with Blake Snell, 100%. If I were to ID one player to watch, burning question would certainly be Blake Snell. My burning question for the Giants is a very simple one. Who are you? What what is the identity of the San Francisco Giants? Are you a speed and defense team? No, you rank 30th in stolen bases out of 30 teams, and you rank 13th in outs above average. So you're not a speed and defense team. Are you a power team? No, you're 24th in home runs. Are you a team that relies on their rotation? Well, you rank 23rd in ERA. Are you a team that relies on your bullpen a lot? Well, no, you rank 23rd in bullpen ERA. What are you? And I think Farhan Saidi needs to figure that out in the next few weeks to even figure out what to add. Are you a team that wants to dominate in the rotation? You go, we got Snell, we got Logan Webb. Cobb is eventually going to come back at some point. But, like, Jordan Hicks is struggling. Kyle Harrison is swing and miss. Or not exactly (laughs) swing and miss. Like, sometimes he's a hit, sometimes he's a miss. Hit or miss is what I meant. (laughs) The bullpen. I like some of the arms at the top, but it gets really dicey in the middle. Yeah. And you look at the lineup, there's some good hitters in there. Mm -hmm. But, like, what kind of hitters are they? I don't really know. it's a really as this ball club is like tweener encapsulated right we're talking about all these tweener teams at the deadline like the braves are excuse me the giants are the definition of a tweener the the definition of are you better than the giants then you're an above average team yeah are you worse than the giants that means you're a below average team 
Yeah. Like being right at 15, that's what I would put the Giants if I were to power rank them, I think, right now. Like right in the middle. What are you? Mm -hmm. What is your plan? But more or less about what your plan is, what is the identity of the San Francisco Giants these days? Yeah. No, I, I'm with you. I'm glad you brought the cop thing up too because – you almost have to hit a parlay for them to to get back into this thing. Yeah. But Cobb has been throwing well in his rehab outings and, you know, adding him to the rotation now, given that they've been wheeling out some rookies and trying to, you know, trying to piece it together. If Blake Snell is also throwing the way that he can throw, like this can be that pitching centric team that, you know, I thought they were kind of supposed to be. And you, you thought that that would be the identity in the past. So I, I think that's the fascinating aspect here is like, do they lean into a certain identity moving forward? Maybe that's in the off season, but I think just the way that this second half goes will kind of help lead them into what they should probably try to attack this off season and moving forward. Absolutely. Let's move to the Colorado Rockies, our last team before we say, uh, have a good weekend, everybody. Um, this is our last one. Do you want to go first or do you want me to? doesn't matter. I have like two. Go ahead. Because there's two fascinating ones to me. First is what does Herman Marquez look like? Yeah. Because all of a sudden, like if Herman Marquez, he just came back off the IL. If Herman Marquez looks good, he's making 10 million this year. He's making 10 million next year with escalators. If he's even a mid fours guy, Cal Quantrill proved that he can pitch out there. And then the stable of arms that they're starting to build up here, you know, Dolander's on the way. Um, I, I like a lot of the, the the fun upside arms that they have throughout this system. Uh, I know they added Brody Brecht, and I know those guys are further away, uh, but I do think that you can kind of talk yourself into a couple of their pitching prospects getting in there sooner rather than later. But just even with what they've been able to find with Quantrill, you know Freeland, when he's healthy, can can survive out there. And now getting Marquez back, the offense has been fun, you know, relatively speaking, uh, than compared to how it's been in the past. I, I think Herman Marquez being good is just huge for them, either because he helps them win more games or – they could move him so easily next year uh, if they wanted to at the deadline and, and have more trade capital. But I'm just super fascinated to see what Marquez looks like. And then uh, I'll, I'll follow up with the second question uh, after, if you have anything to add on Marquez, I know you liked him a lot when he was healthy uh, yeah. and, and he's a talented ass guy. Like he can really throw, but it, it's just been a little bit since we've seen him. And uh, he did kind of falter before the injury. I'll just build off that with my burning question. Are the Rockies going to waste this deadline? You finally have pitchers that I think a lot of teams would be interested in getting. Now, I know Ryan Feltner's stats overall are not great. But if we look at the underlying metrics and we look at how he's done on the road, I think he'd be a pitcher that a lot of teams would be calling in on. Cal Quantrill, self-explanatory. I think at this point, Austin Gomber might be self-explanatory. A guy who cannot pitch in cores, but on the road is a pretty solid left-hander. All three of those guys, I think, could get you a decent prospect package. I also think that there's a couple arms in the bullpen, most notably Victor Victor Vodnik, 25 mm -hmm. years older. He's going to be 25 soon. He's put up a 4-1-1 ERA, easily been the best relief pitcher in this Rockies bullpen. He would definitely get some calls. I think Jalen Beeks would get some calls. And I think, you know, I know that Justin Lawrence, you know, is rocking a 5-8-6 ERA, but that slider is nasty. Like, I still think that he could be – an arm that would be needed for a contender. And then mm -hmm. we look at the lineup. I cannot believe they came out and said that we don't really want to trade Ryan McMahon. I mean, what are we talking about? <laughs> I know it's insane. A 30, like, what are we talking about? You have to trade Ryan McMahon. I think you have to trade Brendan Rogers. I think e even like a team like the Cubs, give them Jacob Stallings, right? Uh, that, like for that, a prospect. That's crazy to me. That, exactly. That like me. Stallings would immediately be their best catcher immediately. So, there's so many guys that aren't going to get you any sort of crazy package, but then you throw even Herman Marquez in there now. There's a lot of arms and bats on this team who may not net you top 100 guys, but could net you somewhere close to that. Then your system is so much deeper. You let the young guys pitch and just see what you got then. Right? Yeah. So that's that's yeah. that's my take on the Rockies. Like, don't be the Rockies again where yeah. – well, we still want to sell tickets and the fans still like these guys. The fans will be happy when you're good again. Yes. like And they're going to show up anyways because the weather is great. So you might exactly. as well start trying to win. Might um, as well start trying to win. If not now, when? When When do we finally understand that like this current roster is not going to do anything ever? <laughs> yes. And to that point, like on the pitching side, you could say, okay, well, Quantrill and, and Marquez could be guys that we hold and then we feel good about. 
Carson Palmquist, who's a funky lefty who can get up there. Sean Sullivan, who's a funky lefty. And then Dolander and Hughes when he comes back off of injury. But those guys are still probably a year or so away. So they have a lot to figure out there in terms of like what direction they want to go. But usually it's just no direction. And they just kind of stagnate, which is why they are always where they're at. And if the other thing keep- that... I was just going to say one thing. If you want to keep those arms, like let's say you want to keep Quantrill and uh, Marquez. Okay, then trade Gomber and Feldner. Like don't and, and the bullpen. Don't let, exactly. Don't let, okay, you want to keep two? That's fine. I'm okay with that, of course. But then trade the others. Don't just yes. then keep them also and just stand pat like that. McMahon makes no sense too. And, and that's another one. But they, and they, they, they seem to do a pretty good job with these relievers. Jaden Hill, remember from LSU, has yeah. looked really good of late, finally throwing strikes uh, in double A. That's a guy that could be fast tracked in their bullpen. He throws a hundred. So like they've got guys in the bullpen that can that can play. Go cash in on those guys. But the 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 one thing that I'm really interested in the rest of the way is Brendan Doyle's been a revelation this year. Oh, yeah. he's on pace for a five one season, and he's exactly what you would want out there. One of the best, if not the best, defender in the sport in center field. Now he can hit too. He's got 15 home runs, 20 bags already. Can. Brenton Doyle keep this up. Remember, this is the same guy that struck out 35% of the time last year and hit 203 at course. Like, if Brenton Doyle is this, you have your franchise piece in center field. And they have needed there's another building block like that. Like, that would be massive for the Rockies as they move forward under control until 2030. Like, that is a huge, huge building block for them. So I think he can. He hasn't slowed down at all going into the break. But I'm really interested in just seeing if he can maintain that the rest of the way, because if he can, that is a huge piece for you moving forward. Shout out Shepherd University, which is where Brenton Doyle was drafted in the fourth round out of in 2019. Shepherd University. That's the last line we're leaving you with with this podcast. <laughs> Shout out Shepherd University. Hopefully everybody enjoyed one burning question for every National League team. And in case you missed it, we got part one. Myself and Jack McMullen did one burning question for every American League team. So again, hopefully everybody enjoyed this episode. And for all of you fans out there, especially of NL Central teams, but fans across the country, please, it would mean the world to us if you joined us on our five stadium tour in five day trip we're going to be hitting all of them you can see the schedule down there on the link the link is in our episode description and using code just baseball will get you five dollars off your tickets to the game in our section where we will be with snapback sports as well it's going to be an absolute blast really really hoping that everybody who can joins us as well as if you need just general tickets shout out at game time Code just baseball, $20 off your first order. And if you're interested in gambling a little bit in the second half, make sure to take advantage of that first bet offer on BetMGM by using code just baseball. Hopefully everybody has an amazing weekend. And while you're enjoying your weekend, maybe get some just baseball merch. Go down to the episode description. Just check out the merch. Just check out the merch. You know, it's getting hot out there. Some polos, some hats, the whole nine yards. For Arnley, I'm Peter Apple. And with that, thank you, everybody.